Now, out of respect for Dr. Wright, I'm only going to quote uh, cite authorities uh, which he finds uh, respectable. So I'm going to quote conservative evangelical scholars for him. Craig Blomberg, in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew on page 181, states, At this stage in his ministry, Jesus may be using the phrase, Take his cross, as simply implying a willingness to sacrifice one's life if necessary for him. And Leon Morris, on page 186 of his commentary on the Gospel of Luke, basically says the same thing. So, uh, not all scholars have understood Jesus' statement and take up their cross to mean that they should go and follow him to the place of execution. Rather, it's an expression that wants to imply, hey, if you're going to take up your cross, that means you should be willing to sacrifice yourselves for me. Okay, so I don't see how the quote you presented from Craig Blomberg uh from his commentary in Matthew 10 refutes Dr. White and supports you. Uh, we see this statement in not, o not only in Matthew 10 but in Matthew 16 also where it says in verse 24 um, when Yeshua when, when Jesus said to his disciples if anyone wishes to come after me he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me the word in the phrase follow me is akulotheo which means um, to follow one who precedes um, to accompany him as in walking the same road Yeshua says here says there that one who wants to be his disciple must be willing to deny himself and willing to lay down his life i.e take up the cross and follow his example so just as he is willing to die to accomplish the will of the Father so we must be willing to lay down our life for him if you think I'm reading too much into this then read verse 25 which is a continuation of the verse in question where he says whoever wishes to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it so I think the point is made very uh, very forcefully uh, secondly even if I were even if we were to assume that your interpretation is correct dr. white uh, yeah it's getting bit, a bit confusing I'm talking to you about you in the third person sometimes I talk to you in the first person <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, even if I were to agree with your interpretation, Dr. White, uh, you really don't answer my question. Even if Jesus told his followers, follow me to the place of execution, that is not proof that Jesus was doing it willingly. Maybe Jesus was unwillingly telling his followers to follow him to the cross because he was ordered to do that. So uh, again, I'm afraid you really didn't answer my question yet. And in light of your repeated dismissal of verses because it might have happened unwillingly uh, maybe it's time for you to define willingness if willingness is doing something on own accord because of uh, an order then I don't see the point you're trying to make but if willingness means that one should be one should go around with a smile from ear to ear uh, jumping for joy then I think you really have a skewed view of willingness uh, speaking about willingness, Yeshua was under no pressure of anyone to lay down his life. He did it out of own accord uh, without anyone forcing him. In fact, those who wanted to prevent him to go uh, that route were rebuked by him. We see that in the case of Peter in Matthew 16 and in the Garden of Gatshmone where he rebuked Peter again. If that isn't showing his willingness, then I don't know what you expect. However, uh, there was someone that claimed to be a prophet who was in a cave one day being forced to read something which he couldn't read if he wanted to anyway, which is even more awkward. Didn't the angel know that the one he forced to read something couldn't do what he demanded from him anyway? But in any event, if that wasn't forcing someone to do something, I don't know what is. 
uh, here we clearly see the distinction between someone being pressured into doing something. So, whereas Yeshua went on his own accord uh, without pressure to do something he was there to do anyway, the one in the cave was under immense pressure to do something he couldn't even do. So, what's your point? Uh, Dr. White, you said that I can't ignore Paul's statement because that would be anachronistic and that I am assuming what I, ha I yet have to prove. Uh, can I easily s turn this around and say that, Dr. White, you are assuming what you yet have to prove, and that is the reliability of Paul as one who receives revelation from God? I mean, seriously, think about it. Who really does have the burden of proof on him here? Do you, do you really want me to just believe that Paul was receiving revelation from God? Come on, we all know that the burden of proof is on you over here, not me. Okay, the reliability of Paul. Uh, the real question is, what reason do you have to deny the reliability of Paul? Again, it, doesn't Islam force you to believe that? Can we easily ask ourselves that question of Muhammad? Don't we have to assume that he is, he was what he claimed he said he was? Um, truth of the matter is, that there is no historical record of Paul being untrustworthy. The eyewitnesses point us to the reliability of Paul since they endorse his message. They never accused him of deviating from what he received from them. And since there is no historical evidence of him being a corrupter and usurper, it is only for theological reasons that you think as bad of Paul as you do, which is exactly what I believe Dr. Y is saying. I mean, what other options do you have? You assume on theological basis only that Paul is untrustworthy, since the only other way to investigate Paul, which is the historical method, proves you wrong and yet again points to the Christian position and away from the Islamic position. Uh, you said, Dr. White, that I would have to start with the presupposition that the New Testament is false in order for me to reject it. Uh, I'm afraid that's not the case. I, I would have to say that this is actually applicable to the Christian. You would have to presuppose that the New Testament is true in order to accept it as true. Now, to tell you my reason, my personal reason, uh, not not everyone has these reasons, but these are my reasons. Why do I, Bassam Zawadi, reject the New Testament? My main reasons are because when I read the New Testament, I do find irreconcilable contradictions. I find clear cases of, of New Testament authors misquoting the Old Testament. So these two things clearly show to me that there are mistakes in the Gospels, that it is not inerrant. I searched long and hard through commentaries to find appropriate answers to my objections. I didn't find them. I would love to see the irreconcilable contradictions and especially the misquotations from the Tanakh, the Old Testament. There is no theologically devastating contradiction in the New Testament. I have searched long and hard to find them and couldn't find them. And I grant you again the freedom to reject and accept what to believe. But if you're going to use double standards when it comes to the Bible and the Qur'an, then I have to question your uh, ability to be an honest seeker of truth. Because there are irreconcilable errors in the Qur'an about history, about what Jews believe, about what Christians believe. And since Muslims claim scientific accuracy in the Qur'an, there are scientific errors in the Qur'an as well. And there are those that know Arabic that claim that there are also uh, grammatical errors in the Qur'an. But that is for them to point out. Uh, I don't know Arabic, but since the Qur'an uh, sets a standard for itself, namely that there are no errors in it, and we find all these errors and on almost all categories, then the Qur'an can't be what it claims to be since it doesn't live up to its own standard for divine revelation.